topic. And as I always say, I dislike when people start live chats or video chats and they're fumbling around with stuff. So as much as possible, I try never to do that. I try to be ready to go and I hopefully am. Um, the topic today is something that, boy, I've talked about this so many times and it's something that I believe so passionately. I remember um, a friend of mine asked me, is this a hill you're willing to die on? And it, it is a hill I'm willing to die on. I think when you choose positions in life, things that mean something to you, things that are important to you, things that are meaningful in the long term, right? After your life is, you know, passed a little bit and you, you sit there and you reflect on things as, as you do at, at certain, I, I always say when you have more years behind you than you do in front of you, you start to reflect on what you've done and not really um, dwell on it, but you want to focus on what you did and what you're going to do in the remaining time in your life. And early on in my life, I, I was um, I, st I started out as a warrior, being a martial artist, and took that into everything else I did, particularly dog training. And when I first started with dogs, I wasn't a dog trainer. I was working in rescue. I was working uh, with bound angels doing my shelter work. And I realized at that point how important it is for humans to do the right thing for dogs because humans bred dogs, humans brought dogs into this world. They, we created these animals, essentially. They're not like this in the wild. We've, they've evolved with us. They've co-evolved with us. They've made us better creatures. So therefore, it's our responsibility to be better to them. The most important thing we do other than feeding our dogs is training them, is giving them the tools that they need to survive in this world that we created. In other words, this is a human world. We have roads, we have cars, we have things that can hurt other creatures that don't understand it. And because of that, we owe it to dogs to train them, to communicate with them. And we want to teach them how to learn. I always talk about, it's not important that you train your dog, but it's important that, or I should say, it's not important. Um, how, the training is not as important as teaching your dog how to learn. We can't expect dogs to just simply learn things by osmosis or by telling a dog, sit down, come, stay, or whatever that might be. That does not teach a dog anything. We teach a dog how to learn before we begin teaching the dog. That's a really important component that I think is often overlooked. So in today's chat, I will address questions, I will address concerns, but what I really want to focus on is the importance, and this is for dog owners and dog trainers. And this is a topic I'm going to be harping on because I have, I mean, there's over a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. Um, there is tons of videos on Facebook. Um, Instagram has, you know, little short videos and stuff. But what's important to me is the decisions we make, right? We, we need to be free to make informed and educational decisions. And a lot of times we're not. So this divisiveness grows between balanced trainers, I should just say dog trainers, and this positive only trainers. Now, I don't recall perhaps other than one or two instances where I made a comment on someone else's page about dog training. In particular, when I disagreed with it. So if I see someone training a dog with a clicker and treats and positive reinforcement, I generally think it's a good thing. I generally think that anyone who's training a dog is doing the right thing. And it's not my position to criticize how they do it, right? It's not my position to say what you're doing is wrong. So I always find it so fascinating when positive only trainers will come over and start criticizing people for using tools. Now, it's not that they're coming and saying, hey, you're abusing that dog. They're not, they're never citing a particular training and saying that's cruel. They're saying 
your method of training is cruel, which I think is so bizarre. Now, in light of that, I always say it's important that you show your chops, right? When, when, when I was in the martial arts, it was easy. You get on the mat and you go toe to toe. You fight the person. Now, I'm not advocating people to fight, but what I am advocating people to do is to show your stuff. Now, there are positive trainers, and I, again, I consider myself a positive trainer, that do amazing things. I watch my wife, Janet, with, with her dog in agility, doing amazing things. I watch her instructor, Melissa Henning, a positive trainer, doing ama- going to the world championships. But when you look at the need of a dog with a behavioral problem or the need of a dog that has a tougher personality or you're training something different, you need to be able to make the decision of what you should and should not choose to do. It's imperative in these times where everything is about choice. All we hear is about all we hear about is how important it is that people be able to identify as they want to identify, choose what they want to choose, believe what they want to believe, except when it comes to things like dog training. That's when your decision is going to be made for you by somebody else. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I believe in positive training. I will never shy away from that. But I also believe in doing what's best for the dog. And when dogs need a little bit more help, when something needs to be made a little clearer to a dog, then you need to be, be able to have that tool or that ability to do so. And by stripping away something like an e collar, for example, let's say we want to say, okay, we're going to make e collars illegal. First of all, I'm not, I would never vote for that. But what will happen is they will strip the e-collar, then they'll strip the prong collar, then they'll strip the slip lead, then they'll strip the, uh, the, the, the chain collar, um, then you, you'll strip the crates out. So it's a slippery slope. And it's what happened in Europe. Europe capitulated. I've told this to all my friends in Europe. You guys laid down and said, oh, no, yeah, no, no, and played this really um, passive game. And it failed. It failed miserably. Europe, Switzerland, uh, I think Denmark, um, Austria, all these countries, no more real tools, right? And now they're trying to get rid of protection dogs. Of course, that's the next level. They will completely control you. Now, remember, this is the smallest group of people. They are the most annoying and loudest group, though. So, what's the right way to go about this? The right way to go about this is to stand up for your right in a very polite way like I've always done. I did it when I was confronted with the Zach George thing. I don't want anybody to insult anybody. I have no insults for these people. I don't wish them any ill will, although many times I have had ill will wished upon me. But I don't wish them ill will. I wish them all the success in the world. In fact, I wish them more success so they can start leaving me alone. The only reason they're doing this really is because they're probably very unhappy people. So um, focus on what you're doing. If you're a dog trainer, do what you're doing. Keep training. Keep doing the right thing. Remember, and I'm, I'm going to talk more and more about dog training and what we should be doing and what we should be um, focused on. That's Maya. Um, and, and, and such, because that's going to make us better. And the better we are, the more people will pay attention. Right? When I can show the results, my results of dog training, and I can show um, my success in dog training, then people would listen to me over the person who's screaming that I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Everything I do, by the way, is online. I mean, you can see the clients I train. 
You can see the dogs I train. You can see my dogs. You can see my dogs were trained on e-collars and prong collars, and there's no happier dogs to train than Goofy or Maya or Dwayne or, or anybody. So that being said, I want to segue now into addressing your concerns, your questions, and uh, a quick shameless plug. Just so you know, I do have a course that's online that's called Shelter Dog Training, and that course is the most intensive course that I've seen on dog training online. It is not a course that uses trained dogs or my pets or anything like that. I believe that I should be able to train my dogs. I should be able to handle my pets. But to show you true dog training, I should be able to show you what I can do with a dog that's not trained. I should be able to show you what I can do with a dog that's difficult. Furthermore, I should be able to teach someone else how to do that. When I see dog trainers online taking a dog from a client and saying, hey, watch this, watch this. Well, that's great, but he's not your dog. So when you're a dog trainer, your job as a dog trainer is to train the dog and the person to be able to do what they need to do to succeed. Not for you to do it. I can get your dog to listen. I can get your dog not to be aggressive. I can get your dog to um, come or stay or whatever it is. But that dog doesn't live with me. So um, in my course, the Shelter Dog Training Course, it's a, it's a deceptive name, but the reason I called it that was because every dog in that course is a dog that was living in the shelter at risk of euthanasia and needed training, had no training. And all those dogs were taken out. All those dogs were trained in those videos, in those lessons. And you'll see it. People who have gone through the course rave about it. It's a lot of lecture, a lot of really intense um, theory, as well as hands-on training. There's no course like it, and it's worth it. You know, I, I think it's, it's a dynamite course. I'm very, very, very proud of it, and um, people who take it get a lot out of it. So um, I'm going to look through here. I'm going to probably be wearing my glasses because uh, Janet went out, and I, I, I can't really see right, so forgive me here. Um, okay, thank you, DeHufford. Great course. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, let's see. First of all, thank you for the free content you've been providing all along these years. I'd like to know your opinion about dogs that prefer, explore, than treats and toys. So um, what you're saying, I, I believe there, is that, hang on, I'm going to put it up on the screen so people can see it. Um, the, you're, you're saying dogs that kind of don't focus on treats and toys and dogs that tend to then get into this mode of sniffing around the ground, stuff like that. You need to be able to train the dog originally in an environment that's a little bit more sterile originally. So in other words, you can't take the dog during a learning phase and have to correct the dog to pay attention to you, popping the dog, hey, hey, pay attention to me. That's not going to work. You need to get the dog in an environment that's completely neutral. Usually I use something like, um, uh, you know, my backyard or, uh, you know, a parking lot um, where there's no, not a lot of smells because grassy smells, dirt smells. And I always keep the dog on a line. Those are real important things. So you need to build the dog's focus to you. And I usually do that by not feeding the dog out of a bowl. I feed the dog out of my hand. That gives my, myself the ability to become much more interesting than the ground. Once you do that, then you can kind of, um, you know, go from there. So I'm going to keep trying to go back to see where I can find um, questions that, that, that are relevant. Um, in the Bay, um, I'm a member of your site, and I've learned so much. Thanks for Well, you're quite welcome, and thank you for that comment. Lori, um, thank you for your love and heart of the dogs, owners. You're good. Well, thank you. I, I do try to make sure that we're looking at the big picture, and that is what's the best for the dogs and the dog owners, because dog owners that can't train their dogs usually end up getting um, getting rid of their dogs. Okay, Suzanne says, I'm a volunteer at my local shelter. And I just started to train a deaf dog with hand signals. He's almost a year old and has not had any training. So far, pretty good with hand signals, but pulls hard and walks. Any help you can give me? <clears throat> and again, that, the, the dog to be next to you or the dog to not pull on a leash, um, I, use the, I use the 180 degree turnabout. I lure the dog, I keep the dog in a position next to me, I'll give a lot of treats next to me, I'll get the dog to really focus on wanting to be next to me. I think that's really important. And then I give the dog the opportunity to disengage and to go away, and at a distance, I use a long line for that, um, like 10 to 15 feet, then I turn and re -correct, I correct the dog, correct the dog, correct the dog, 
and then um, reward the dog for being next to me. So I don't expect the dog to walk directly next to me to focus heel, but I do expect the dog to stay really, really close. Um, let's see here. Sometimes it's easier if you put a question mark before the question so that I know that it's a question. If not, anyway. Um, female GSD Tracy 2010. Um, she actually has a drive that I have not that I have yet to completely get a handle on. Any suggestion on how to get the most control on? All tools have been used. So the tool that you want to rely on mostly here, Tracy, is the tool of you. Too many people rely on a tool to do something. In other words, the, the dog has a high level of drive. Well, a dog that has a high level of drive is a dog that needs to focus that drive onto something, and that something needs to relate back to you. Um, you're not going to take a dog that has, has a high degree of drive and, and, and turn that drive down. That just doesn't happen. It, it needs somewhere to go. So usually you want it to go towards a toy or towards obedience or towards barking or towards um, engaging or turning and, and, you know, and, and different activities. That's the most important part to do is figure out where you can get that dog to put that drive that will make a big difference. You're not going to shut it down. Um, all right, let's see. Um, you guys are talking about where the tools are banned. Florence, Mississippi. Nice to see you. Iowa. Um, all right, here we go. Pauline has a question. Um, these are all from Facebook, uh, from YouTube. Oh, there's a Facebook. Okay. Um, seven-month-old Pyrenees English Mastiff mix is very mouthy and gets jumpy. She's 80 pounds. Well, she's a seven-month-old puppy, and that's not uncommon for a seven-month-old puppy, but what I would suggest you do is teaching the dog to be calmer, by, I, I would have the dog dragging a line, and when the dog jumps onto people, if the dog is jumping, it's one thing, but if the dog is jumping on people, step on that leash and prevent the dog from jumping. When the dog is calm, be calm with the dog. The calmer you want a dog to be, in other words, if a dog is really excited, it's hard to um, yell at that dog for that. You don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to be calmer. I exhibit the, the state you want the dog to be. In other words, if I have a dog that's kind of flat, then I'm going to get really excited, and that's going to um, get the dog excited. Right? That's really, really important. Okay, Nadja, there's that's a, we've got a Facebook comment. Thank you for inspiring me to become a dog trainer. Well, you're quite welcome, and thank you for becoming a dog trainer, because if you became a dog trainer through my, my inspiration, I hope you're following um, what I really hope to do for people, and that is to give them the best relationship with their dogs. Um, Rico, for you, um, just a quick hello. Thank you for support and right away to educate my Mally girl. Um, have ordered your latest jacket and hoodie and a bad California tea for my wife. Good. On the way to Madrid, Spain. Well, I'd like you to send me a picture from Madrid with your uh, bad canine California license plate and your, your, your Cabral gear. Mark Sika from Kenya. I was just talking about Kenya, one of my favorite places I have ever visited, and I intend on taking Janet there at some point because... Um, I do love love Africa and Kenya and, and Rwanda and Uganda are my favorite places. From Europe, nice. That's a very broad comment, but hello from Europe. Um, Mizat, Mizat, Min Wanjat, oh, I'm not sure. How do I get my dog to stop chewing kids' stuffed animals? Kids are new to my house, Malinwan Lab. Um, you, you don't let the, the dog chew on them. You put them away. You either put the dog away or the child away, uh, the child's toys away, because otherwise you're going to have that. I've got Norway here. I appreciate you and Larry Crone, Greg Garza. Thank you so much. I appreciate you too. Um, from Michigan, all American caniners in the house. Okay, good to see you. Um, all right, so let me scroll down now to near the end, and let's get um, Massachusetts. i got a lot of people in here. I love it. I love seeing this. Um, got 250 people in here, and I appreciate each and every one of you, by the way. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to see where I left off here. This is a little bit hard. Usually, uh, Janice uh, dials this in for me. She's a little busy right now, but, um, okay. All right, here, I'm going to start with Bree here. Bree says, um, are you, you are amazing. Just thank you so much for that, by the way. I'm not amazing. I'm just really normal. I'm just trying to do what I do. Um, but I appreciate that. Thank you. If I will do more videos on Canine Good Citizen, AKC Obedience, yes, I am actually doing that. I'm in a process um, of doing that with the people I'm working with right now. So there will be more videos on the Canine Good Citizen, which is something that I think is a really good test. And uh, 
Also, I'm kind of veering it into the BH, which is the, which is the um, USCA, the Schutzen version of, um, of, that, of, of that same kind of thing. Um, okay, Brittany Cook. My dog doesn't want treats when she gets distracted on walks. Any tips to help work around that? Well, you need to find something that she will want, something that's e exciting to her. Now, depending on how you're doing these walks, are you getting her into an environment that's super distracting right away? Because if you are, then it's very hard for the dog to shift that focus, right? In other words, if I have, let's say I'm using kibble as a treat and it works great in the house and in the yard, but I get outside and there's cars running, racing by and, and kids running, riding skateboards and other dogs, well, it won't match up to that. So I want, would try to disconnect. I would try to get a little further away from those distractions if it's possible, if you live in an area like that. Now, if you live in the middle of Manhattan, probably not going to be possible, but you would as much as possible try to disconnect the dog from those distractions and get the dog paying attention to you. Try a more high value, something you wouldn't use in the house, maybe hot dogs, maybe string cheese or something like that. Try having a toy with you, something like the dog's favorite, favorite toy. They don't ever get to play with that unless um, you're really working on something important. Those are all steps that, that would help you. Okay, Orange Cones, that's a funny name. I want to ensure my dog, next dog is physically and mentally mature before considering neutering. Is there an age I should wait for in a Malinois? Um, it's a very good question. You want to make sure the dog is physically mature yes uh, mentally mature you know i mean th that depends on the dog i still think goofy is a goofball and Dwayne is almost five he's gonna be five this year and he's very um immature in a lot of ways which is good you want that 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 immaturity is a f is a thing that's like that youthfulness that playfulness that I, I love in my dogs um maya is very mature jimmy's very mature jimmy was very mature before but he's a very mature dog um so it doesn't really go by the breed as much as sometimes certain dogs will breeds will mature sl more slowly more slowly but um i would say at least at least a year to two years you know um, before they're mature enough to do to, to neuter them if you can if you can wait um christine houtby I have a four-month-old golden retriever. I know she is teething, but at night she seems to get aggressive and bites us. How do we change that? Um, you know, there's it's funny. They always talk about this thing called the witching hour, and that is that sunset time to sundown time when animals are, they're nesting, they're running around, and instinctually they, they just tend to be a little bit more rambunctious. So my suggestion to you is to try to be calm during those times. Make sure um, you can get the dog in a crate, um, maybe take the dog out one more time, try not to play with the dog, try to be, you know, as chill as you can with the dog so the dog starts to learn that. Now, the dog is four months old. Yes, she is teething. She's going to be teething for at least a month or so, and you need to be patient during that. Give her something to chew on. Give her a frozen banana. Give her a Kong. Give her a, a lamb bone. Give her some turkey necks or some frozen turkey necks, frozen bananas, something to chew on to kind of satiate that drive because it, it does sometimes get a little bit worse at night. Okay, um, I'm not sure if that's Jan or Jan. Um, um, can you explain how toys and play works in training or relationship? My favorite part. I did not realize how important I am. I did not realize how important. I did not realize how important. I am a member of your site. Okay, I didn't realize it. I read that wrong. I cannot thank you enough for such great information, which I'd found your site sooner, but still making great strides with a nine and a half month old poodle. My 89 year old mom even watches to help with the pup. Well, that's really great. That's fantastic. So um, toys are important because it's a bonding experience. We use treats and toys. Anybody who tells you not to use toys or not to use treats is wrong, dead wrong. You need to use both because they're different components of the, rela of the same relationship. So um, it's like saying you're going to only use positive and not use negative, or you're only going to, um, you know, jump up and never land. It, it, it makes no sense. Toys cement that playfulness and control between you and the dog. So if I control the dog's play, then I control the dog's excitement levels and their the way they. Um, they let out their drives. So in other words, a dog that's really excited, a dog is frustrated, I can play tug with the dog, I can play ball with the dog, I can throw the ball, the dog chases the ball, the dog brings the ball back to me, maybe tugs, maybe just lets the ball go. 
but I'm controlling the dog's movement and the dog's drive. So the more you do that, the better the relationship becomes because the dog looks to you where they should um, let those behaviors, those drives, and those experiences out. Whenever it's with you, it's a much, much better thing. So the more you can play with the dog, the happier the dog will be. It's really, really, really critical. I really have an issue when people um, try to tell you not to do that. Okay, Moose, um, how do you overcome the human element of one-on-one -on -one dog training and public advocation? With so much positive-only training, how do you deal with explaining tools of use? Um, I don't understand how do I overcome the human element of one-on-one -on -one dog training and public advocation. I'm, I'm confused on that. I don't know what you mean by that. So if you want to ask it again in a different way, great. Um, with so much positive-only training, how do you deal with explaining tools and use? Well, first of all, I don't think there's that much positive-only training. Here's the thing. If I go to a party and somebody tells me they're a vegan, I mean, I should say, I go to a party, I'm going to immediately know who's a vegan because they're going to tell me right away they're a vegan. And I'm going to know whoever's a positive-only trainer because they're going to tell me they're a positive-only trainer. I've never gone to anybody and said, hey, hi, I'm a balanced dog trainer. No, I'm a dog trainer, and that's it. And I really don't bring it up at parties or anything like that. Um, in fact, it's something I, I, I dislike bringing up because then people start asking you a lot of questions, and it, it causes this big pandemonium. I like to kind of lay low. So... Um, you know, even if I'm at the park, if I see people making mistakes with the dogs, it's not my job to interfere. I respect their relationship. So, um, I don't really explain things unless somebody asks me. And if they ask me and I feel like they're trying to trick me up, then I just tell them, look, do you want to hear the truth or do you want to hear what you want to hear? And that's always been one of my big issues in life is that people generally want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the truth. If you're making a mistake with your dog and you ask me for, for advice, rarely do you want to know the truth and how to solve it. Generally, you want me to tell you what you're doing is right and, um, you know, and give you some kind of a modification on it. But uh, a lot of times if you're making a mistake and you want some information, you, know, you don't really, really want to hear it. So Addie says, love your content. Can I crate train my two-year-old border collie after not being crate trained? And will that help build engagement? Um, you can build, train a two-year-old dog to be, be crate trained. It's going to take a lot more time. You need to make the crate a very positive experience. Feed the dog in the crate, um, treats in the crate and everything like that. Um, and use short durations to make sure the dog understands that it's not a punishment. That's really, really important. Um, and it'll help you build engagement because what happens generally in training, in the training scenario dogs tend to have so much attention from you all day. And this is now my dogs are all out. Our dogs are all out. Dwayne is out. Every time he comes up to Janet or me, he's going to get love. Maya, Goofy, Jimmy, you know, they all, every time they come up to us together, because they're older. Now, Dwayne's not. But um, if you want your dog to have more engagement to you, then you really want to limit the downtime engagement. In other words, if the dog is getting attention from you for doing nothing, then when you take the dog outside, there's a lot of freedom and a lot of other things to find. So with puppies early on, I like to use the crate as a cool off period. So when you're in the crate, there's nothing for you to think about. There's nothing for you to do, but just relax. And when you come out, it's on, right? Then we're on, we're training, we're focusing, we're doing stuff. And I want that focus. And if I don't have that focus and I need to get the dog to understand that, this is a valuable time when we're training. And I used to, when I taught karate to kids, I learned um, quickly that training children was very sim became very similar as, as training dogs. You don't want to spend, I see people out in, in, in um, parks training for 30, 40 minutes, an hour. And it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming for the dog. If you can get a dog to do the right thing, in 5, 7, 10, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, if it's a really high draw, drive, like a Duane Amater or like a Malinois or something like that, put the dog away. Always, always, always put the dog away when the dog is succeeding. People will do a focused heel and they'll wait for the dog to look down and then they pop the dog. And then the dog realizes, whoa, and then the, you get a yo-yo dog. What I would do with the dog is when the dog is looking at me, stop. Stop, pay the dog, reward the dog, play with the dog, you know, and, and mark the, those behaviors. 
and then extend a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. The idea of pushing the dog for more and more engagement, more and more focus, is what breaks your dog eventually because the dog can't handle it. It's, it's really unfair to the dog. Okay, Laney says, I walk someone else's cavapoo in a pack. He is intact. Owner refuses to neuter but humps females and becomes obsessive. He is on lead along with other dogs, but correction don't work. Distraction don't work. Even when the dog tells him off, he still persists. Don't know what technique to use. Well, I wouldn't bring that dog into your pack. That's the first thing um, because he's not listening to you. What I would do is I would get the dog to understand that that is not acceptable. And that you're not going to do that in a pack. You're going to do that one-on-one. -on -one. And it's something that I take personally because I consider it a very rude. It's a sexual violation on another dog. It's a dominance violation if it's a same-sex um, dog, like if it's two males. And it's something that I just don't tolerate. I'll grab the dog. I do it very early on with dogs, by the way. I don't allow them to hump pillows, hump couches, hump me, hump my shoes, hump my socks, um, hump any other dogs in the house just not acceptable i just i don't make it i don't punish the dog for it i just grab them by the scruff of their neck and go hey knock it off and i move them away from what they're humping and i'll do it over and over and over and over again which is the exact same thing a mother dog would do now i'm not saying you should train your dogs like dogs train dogs that's all bs i understand that but what i am saying is you need to stop the behavior. And this is not one of these positive feel-good things like, oh, I'm going to offer him a distraction or a, a click in a treat or a cookie or a hot dog or whatever. No, you are physically going to stop the dog what they're doing. In other words, if your dog is running to the street, you're going to grab him either by a leash or by the scruff of their neck and go, hey, don't you do that. You're not going to throw treats on the ground, right? Treat correcting a dog like it means something and you will get a better result. I promise you that. It's a clear picture to the dog. Most people are not clear to their dogs or to any dogs. Bonita Smith says, eight-month mal uh, male GSD working line. I'm trying to figure out how to stop his barking at, our, at other dogs and our cats. I have had him since he was three months old. Also, what kind of job can I give him? Well, if he's a working line dog, you should have him doing working line stuff. Like... Um, protection work or tracking or anything like that. Um, the reason he is barking at the dog, uh, at the cat, dogs and other cats, uh, other dogs and cats, is because he's probably trying to initiate play, and that's generally what's what's going to happen with a young puppy, like an eight-month-old puppy. They want to play, and uh, barking in their instinct creates movement. They bark, something moves, they chase it. That's totally normal. When something is still, they bark to get it to move. That's how we train um, with protection work, for example. You, you, know, you have a toy, you bark, the ball moves, and then you're still, and then he barks, and then it moves, and then they get to bite. Um, you, need to, you need to figure out some games, some tug games and stuff like that. You need to teach the dog a bark on command. You need to teach the dog a down, a quiet command, and you need to reward both of those abundantly. Okay, um, I just want to make sure everybody's getting a chance to ask questions, Facebook and YouTube. These are YouTube questions here. I see a Facebook one underneath, so that's great. I, I'm, I'm glad to be on Facebook and YouTube because I've got a lot of friends and followers on Facebook, and I want to make sure that I'm here for all you guys. It's just hard for me to do two completely separate lives, so I think doing a nice long live like this for both platforms, it really helps everybody out a lot. Um, and I'm very flattered, 275 people in the room um, chatting with me and, and watching and listening to this. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving your dog a chance. And every time I see large turnouts like this on my lives and my videos, I see that dog training has a lot of potential. And there is not this overwhelming psychosis of a one-sided dog training. I, you guys believe in balance training, in giving your dog the tools and the skills they need for a happy, happy life. And like I say, if you haven't checked it out yet, my website, robertcabral.com, tons of great, I mean, tons and tons and tons, 60 plus hours of dog training available there. Plus on the uh, on the shelter dog course, it's a, it's a separate course for people who want to be dog trainers using shelter dogs. There's um, 25 plus hours of instruction on that, and it's a course onto itself that is like nothing else I've ever seen. So... Victor Salazar says, my three-year-old female, not fixed, German Shepherd, attacked my six-year-old last episode twice. Um, she is really nice dog, aggressive. She is really, 
dog aggressive and went after another dog and continues to be dog aggressive. Well, um, I mean, is your, is your Lhasa Apso a female? That's one thing I would like to know because two females fighting is really, really hard. Now, generally, if the other dog is not a female, if it's a male, then the female usually will dominate. I don't know how bad this attack was, but I've seen females go after males and then it's kind of over. If she's dog aggressive, then you should be training her and you need to protect your Lhasa Apso. But Lhasa Apso are a very, very strong dog. I don't know if you know that or not, but uh, I had one when I was a young, young boy and um, his name was Gatsby. And Gatsby was a really strong, strong dog. We rescued him. And um, you need to be on this dog you need to manage this dog and it, it can be done ultimate structure ultimate obedience ultimate relationship but it can absolutely be done but it's going to take controlling everything in that three-year-old females um thing and when you're saying not fixed i'm just going to be clear on something females it doesn't matter sometimes fixing a female can make them more aggressive because females in general have the estrogen energy which is not the combative fighting type energy as testosterone is for those of you who are going to um decipher male to female thing i hope you guys aren't in here because this, it gets too confusing but the general hormone of testosterone is the one that would be the more dominant tending to fight and the estrogen would be the calming nurturing type energy so I don't think neutering her would help. It probably would, wouldn't hurt, but um, it's not. It has nothing to do with the issues. What I'm trying to say. Okay, here we go. Facebook from Massachusetts. Very good. I still have family in Rhode Island, so I want to make sure I get that. In there. Okay, Boston says um, I have a two-year-old Belgian Malinois who has been obedience training by me every day since the day I got him. I used the U.S. Marine Corps military working dog training. Well, that's excellent. Fantastic. Um, Joe says, I'm a dog trainer, in Cape Town, South Africa. Thank you for all you've taught me. Well, thank you. Nice to hear. Nice. To, I love, love, love hearing from you guys all over. Look at that. Look at that, honey, right here. I got South Africa. We had Kenya. Now we have Northern England. Um, and then we have Georgia. Avi is in Georgia now. Okay. Tallahassee. This is a, like a lesson in ge geography. England. Okay. Right, here we go. Um, Oh, okay, so now this is the continuation. Now, this is very rare that I can remember what I read six comments back and, and, and continue. So this is the, the military dog working manual. I'm starting him on bite training Any rec and recommendations for someone in the beginning of the bite training process. Um, you got to find somebody. I don't, I, don't know your, I don't understand your question. Sorry about that. Um, I don't understand what your question is, but you should be able to find somebody to help you with bite training because that's going to be something that you, you need help with. It's, you don't really want the dog biting on you per se. You can play with a tug or a rag or something, but... Um, you really want somebody who can bring that out in a specific way. And there's a lot of talk about these newer methodologies of, of starting bite work, which is what I plan on doing with my puppy when I get them. Um, but it, it's, it's very different than the old methodologies of using prey or defensive drives. And I, I kind of am really uh, enthralled by doing that. I was talking with um, Oscar about it the other day. So Susan says, can you advise me how to get a deaf dog to look at me so I can give the hand signals for training. Thank you. Yeah. So in this situation, here's a great tool to use. Get yourself an e-collar and put it on vibrate mode. A great thing. But get the dog used to the e-collar first. Have it in your hand, vibrate in your hand, touch the dog with your hand. Um, have it in your hand, put your dog's, you know, your, your dog's chin on it, turn it on. Don't just slap it on the back of a deaf dog and start vibrating. It can be a little spooky. But once the dog understands that this is a good thing, like I say, I put it in my hand, I would massage the dog with it um, and then have it vibrating so the dog gets really used to it. Because deaf dogs can be kind of spooky uh, as they should be because that's a really important part of their senses that they're hearing. So, But yeah, I would use a vibrate 100%. Khalid Bajat any suggestions what and where to buy bite training kit for German Shepherd? Well, there is no bite training kit per se. Um, generally, you would start a young puppy on, you know, with rag work and then like little jute pillows and stuff like little bite pillows, puppy pillows, and then graduate up to depending on what you're going to do with the dog. If you're going to do um, sleeve work, you would want to get a sleeve. Um, and if you're into suit work, you'd want to get a suit. And, you know, I mean, I always want to give a plug to uh, Guy at uh, Hard Dogs Requisites, which is my favorite gear. Um, I don't know if he's listening to this, but if he is, he'll be happy to hear that. 
Anna says, I have a two-year-old corgi. She goes with me everywhere. When people ask to pet her, she immediately jumps on people and starts licking and biting in small bites like she would do to a sheep. Well, first of all, if you're taking your dog with you everywhere, you might be inclined to not let people pet her and touch her. For the reason for that is, is because she's going to become so obsessive about going up to people. I see this at Gold's Gym. Everybody with their fake service dog um, has their fake service dog um, doing fake service dog work. And then anybody who comes up to that dog, the dog leaves their fake service dog area and starts getting petted and cookies and playing with other people. So um, my opinion is just let the dog be a dog and nobody needs to meet the dog. Put a vest on the dog that says do not pet. Jerome Lick says, puppy just finished all its shots. What are some good ways to socialize him a bit more safely? He's excited to meet other dogs and people, but screams and barks on a leash when seeing them. Well, then I would highly advocate to you that when he screams and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and barks, that he does not get to meet them. Because when he screams and barks and then he gets to meet them, he learns that the more I scream and bark, the more I get to meet them. So my dogs don't get to meet other dogs. My dogs meet my dogs in my pack, my family. They'll meet a friend's dog. If I know that dog is friendly, the friend can come over with their dog and they can meet or they can go someplace and play with that dog. But for the most part, in a social settings, I expect my dog to be social. Social does not mean going up to everyone and meeting them and talking to them and hugging them and humping them. That's not what we do. So um, for you, I would get the dog exposed and I would not let the dog meet everybody. AJVF, how can I get my four-month-old puppy to stop pounding on my other two small dogs? I'm keeping her on a leash in the house until I leave it and pull her away from my Pomeranian Papillon when she lunges at them. I also try standing in front of her um, and get her in a submissive position. Well, I wouldn't really do that. What I would probably do is put the dog in a crate and let the dog see the other dogs. And I would take her out, giving, giving her some treats, getting her to focus on me, getting her to be calm, short interactions. Because this constant pulling her on a leash and standing in front of her and all that stuff is just becoming very frustrating. You're frustrating the dog and frustration brings out negative characteristics in dogs. So um, a crate is your best friend. I don't know why people don't do more of that. Dave Harper. That's a fine looking Labrador you have there. Um, What would be the best method of training to stop a dominant male marking all the time in the show of dominance? So, Um, the marking, I'm assuming you're you're saying on a walk, and it's something very, very common for dogs to do, um, just don't let them do it, right? In other words, your dog comes out of the house, gets a chance to potty, and then you just take off on a walk. Your walk is a determined walk. I'm going from here to, you know, two blocks, and then I'll stop and let you mark again. You want to rewire the dog's brain not into having this free time to go marking and sniffing, but instead to focus on you on the walk. That doesn't mean a focused heel. That means just like a focused walk, like, hey, we're going somewhere and we're, we're heading there in such a brisk pace that um, we, we, there's no time to stop for marking. You know, just th- it's hard to stop it once they're peeing and then you say, hey, knock it off. Now you're in this kind of constant struggle. So we had almost 300 people in here. That's pretty, that's, that might be a record. It's really nice to see. Um, by the way, again, I want to talk to you guys about the, the importance of training. Right. The training you do, somebody, there's one question that's going around on Facebook right now that's super, super common. And that is um, w- somebody said, what do I do when somebody criticizes me for correcting my dog in public and, and, and saying I'm an ass for doing that? Well, the only ass is the person who's, who's correcting me. Right. Correcting a dog for misbehavior is not abusive. It is a correction. It is a physical manipulation of an action. Nowadays, we are so concerned with bullying and, 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 and abuse and all these things that it's really watered down communication. Like if a coach puts a kid in and gives him a pat on the shoulders or a pat on the back or a pat on the butt, that's all it is, right? If it's more, if it's abusive, we should address it as that. And this is what I always say about um, you know, humane laws. We have tons of humane laws that should be enforced. No animal should be abused. No child should be abused. No human being should be abused. 
but we need to be a little clearer on what abuse is. Right? We need to toughen up a little bit because strength has been so watered down in society that we're raising a generation of wimps, of kids. I was literally walking yesterday in Beverly Hills. I had an errand to do, and I didn't even tell you this, honey. When I was walking on, I swear to you, I saw all these kids. They're all hunched over in a corner like this on their front, like this. You can't see people's faces anymore. Honest to God, people are walking down the street like this. They're crossing crosswalks like this. They're sitting like this. They're sitting across from their parents and their dates and their children and their friends like that. I look at people's posture now, and it's all this weird hunched over thing because it, it, it's, it's a society of wimps. There's nothing physical anymore. I mean, Stoops and I were talking about the other day. Man, you know, when we were younger, we would go outside, we'd play stickball, we'd get in a fight, we would wrestle, we would do all these things. We had a really fulfilling physical experience in youth. Now kids want to sit in front of a computer and simulate flying a plane. They want to you know, do games of war. Well, we used to play cowboys and Indians. We used to play, you know, a war. We used to do all these things. And it was fun. It was physical. And when we start to, and I see this in my friends, by the way, I'm not mentioning names, but, you know, my friends are so out of shape. They're so, you know, they're, they're just not working out. They're not eating right. They're just, you know, they're, they're, a few of my friends are in good shape. But, you know, this is really important. We need to focus on that. Anyway, that's my lecture. Okay, so now from Georgia, Linda McManus, I got jacket and vest for Christmas, and I love both of them. Fantastic. That is great to know. I'm glad you got it. I'm glad you like it. Post some pictures. Gabby, hi from Germany. I have, a four, I have four German shepherds, and I learned a lot from you. Well, thank you, especially coming from Germany. It's Freudmisch. Danke. Anze says, I adopt five-year-old Belgian German shepherd. Would she bark at other dogs on very far a lot? Do you have any suggestions to deal with it other than work without dogs around until we have good... Well, you should work without other dogs until, until you have good foundations, but you can't avoid dogs, right? That's the one thing. And that's what people will tell you who don't have a good grasp on training. They'll say, well, just avoid other dogs. Well, you can't avoid other dogs, right? You can try to use distance as your friend, like cross the street, but a dog that's lunging at another dog, you need to turn around, you need to focus in another direction, and you need to get the dog to focus back to you. You need to use corrections for that. If a dog is lunging at another dog, I don't care what is happening, I abruptly turn and I go the other way. That's it. Every single time. I'll do it, I'll turn, and I'll come back. And I'll turn, and I'll come back. And I'll do it if, I mean, sometimes I say to the person, I say, hey, do you mind just standing there with your dog so I can train my dog through this? And in two or three or four times, the dog is like, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this guy because it's, it's uncomfortable to keep doing this. And that's a real important part is that when we're training a dog, sometimes we have to use the absence of comfort to create behaviors that we want. We use a slighter discomfort. A great example of this is a vaccination. Probably not a good topic to talk about nowadays. But when we take the dog to the vet, we give him a rabies shot. It's not comfortable. It's a needle. Sometimes they, they have a little irritation from it or we get a flu shot. We get flu-like symptoms. And then we um, feel better. We don't get sick, right? That's really, really critical. Okay, Janet just handed me one. When Janet hands me one, it's always a good one. Um, from Kristen, Michelle, any advice for raising two female seven-month-old puppies together? They're Belgian Malinois Dutch Shepherd. Uh, my suggestion to you is run for the hills. Um, I never, ever, ever suggest raising two puppies from the same litter, in particularly two females. You're, you're notoriously going to have problems. I hate to say it. Don't do it. I don't, don't do it. Because you need to focus on getting your one dog train. It's impossible to train two, unless you're going to have a, run a kennel and you're going to keep them in crates and bring them out, bring them away, bring them up. But for them to be raised together, especially dogs of that drive, they're going to have issues. Nice as Doom, hang on, I'll get to that one in one sec. Nice as Doom says, I have a seven month old golden retriever who I can't get to stop digging in the yard. Any suggestions? I gave this advice years ago. Many people took it. It's not my original advice, by the way. I don't know who's, where I got it from, but the, it's not credit to me. And the idea is what you do is you get a kiddie pool, one of those plastic kiddie pools you used to buy at Toys R Us, and you fill it with sand, and you take all your dog's toys and you bury them 
in that pool, like five, six different toys. And they dig and they get a toy and they dig and they get a toy. In other words, you're teaching them. This is a very positive methodology because the old Bill Keeler method was not that friendly. Um, you're teaching the dog, I dig here and something happens. Because the dog is digging for frustration and frustration can be combated when there's a solution to that frustration, which means they dig, 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 and they find something. And they dig, 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 and they find something. So it's constantly rewarding for digging in that one spot. And then they'll stop digging in other spots because there's, there's, no, um, there's no reward there. So it, it works. I guarantee it works. Um, that's what I suggest to you. Okay, the question Janet handed to me was, um, Lisa Smith, dealing with dog aggression with my two-year-old male working line German Shepherd. Trainer had me using e-collar on high stim to stop the aggression, and it made it much worse. Well, yeah, it will. Um, it, it's not about the level of stim when you're dealing with dog aggression using an e-collar. It's how the dog sees it. In other words, if I let a dog go up to another dog and I put pressure on that dog when the dog is now acting aggressive, oftentimes the dog will trigger that aggression to the other dog. In other words, they will see that the pressure you're putting on his neck is coming from the other dog and it increases the aggression. The way we do it is the way I do it is I redirect the dog constantly. And when the dog won't redirect, I correct the dog for not redirecting back to me. Or I tell the dog to sit. And when the dog gets up to lunge, I correct and the dog is getting corrected for not sitting. So the correction is always... A, on a preemptive measure. In other words, it's for getting out of the sit or not paying attention to me or not redirecting back to me and stuff like that. Um, you're going to need to use distance as your friend. You're going to need to break it down for your dog. You need to get the dog, hey, pay attention to me. Hey, sit. And when the dog turns away, boom, no. And then the dog will get corrected for not listening to you. That's really, really, really important. Which one? Jane? Jens? Jens? Uh, Jens, I have another one. Do you have any lobby into government who is fighting for training? In, do I have a, any lobby into government who is training? I'm, I don't understand the question. Do I have any lobby into the government who is fighting for training in four quadrants? Well, you know, all training should be in the four. I, I don't think there should be anything about not being in the four quadrants. Anybody who understands that um, knows that the four quadrants, there is reward and punishment, you know, which I call corrections. But... I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. I think the problem in um, lobbying is taking three of the quadrants away and only focusing on one of the quadrants, which is not science. It's, it's not logical either. Um, well, we're over 300 people in the room now. I hate to keep doing this, but you get, I get really impressed when, uh, when that happens. Um, oh, good. Sherry. Sherry and Harold are here. Wouldn't miss a chance to learn from you. Thank you so much. Uh, we love Sherry's food. You guys should check that out. She's got some great supplements and some great recipes for those of you who are interested in feeding raw. Um, e for all, essentials, e for all supplements.com. And I think you're getting a new uh, site as well, which that's, that's a good one for now. There's a lot of information on there. Ellen says, doing your course, absolutely loving it. Sending thanks from the UK. Well, Ellen, thank you so much. Please post a testimonial. Uh, when you finish, I'd love to hear about that. Um, I'm really interested in hearing what you guys think about the course because the course is really, Janet even said that when I was putting it together, she said, boy, this is really your mission. This is really what, you, what you're what you all about. And it, it really is because take away all the money and all the fame that I've gotten from what I do, the core mission was really to change things for dogs. My core mission was really to help dogs that nobody was helping, that people were completely overlooking, that people wasn't, weren't caring about, that people abandoned, that were at risk of being killed. I mean, a dog in somebody's home, okay, you know, he doesn't sit, you know, or in a competition, oh, he's not doing a perfect focus heel, he's not doing a great long bite or whatever. I don't care, right? I could care less about that. But a dog that's at risk of dying because somebody gave up on him, that's the dog I want to focus on. Okay, Lisa, your question is, 11 with old German Shepherd sees my husband as alpha, minds him well. I'm working on him seeing me as a leader, not a playmate. At bedtime, my husband will attempt to kiss me goodnight, but the dog will aggressively growl and bark, getting between us. Is this resource guarding me? Yes, 100%. How do we correct him? Uh, appreciate any tips. Uh, enjoy your sight. Learning a lot from you. Thank you. Okay, so a dog does not own anything for his own safety. You own everything. Your husband owns everything. Um, I do not tolerate it, right? In other words, you and your husband belong to each other. Janet and I belong to each other. 
There is nobody, no dog, no person, no no nothing, no possession, no thought, nothing that gets between me and my wife. That's the most important thing in the world to me is my wife. So if a dog challenges that, I will challenge that dog. I will put the dog in their place. I don't care how much I love that dog. That dog's job is to be a dog and to be my dog and my wife's dog. He will never, ever show resource guarding, aggression, or anything like that over either of us. I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's cute. Usually it starts off, oh, look, he's being cute. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No. If the dog growls, I would have a line on him. I would set him up for this. I would put a line on the dog. And at this age, that you're at the end of your window for fixing this behavior. Because once he gets to be 14, 16, 18 months old, he's going to bite. So I would have a line on him. I would say, sit. And I would walk over and I would kiss my wife. And if the dog started to growl, I'd go, hey, sit. In other words, I'd put him at a distance of 10 feet, 5 feet, so that there's a distance. And I would do it. And then... I would allow the dog to just see it over and over. And when the dog was calm, I'd walk over and say, good boy. And then I'd give him a hug or a pet or a cookie or something like that. You must 100% address this now. This will not get better on its own. I promise you that. Forget what anybody else told you. I've seen dogs end up biting people because of this. And it's a, it's a scary, scary thing. So please fix that. Um. Okay, I only got time for a couple more because we're, we're running out of time. Um, okay, Roberto and Metka from Italy. Roberto is my real name, by the way, so nice to see you here, Roberto. That's a fine-looking dog you got in your picture. From which months do you train puppies to bite work? Do you do it during the months they are dirt changing? This is a brilliant question, and this is a question that I have asked so many times to people like Frank Phillips, who is my person that I would look to and he doesn't teach i mean he does seminars but um i consider and i always ask that question like what about bite work now I, with goofy i did bite work early on um and even when he was teething i you know when he's teething i didn't do anything but just before his teething i was doing um work with rags and 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 and, and tugs and after bite work after teething i would start with you know like little puppy sleeves and stuff like that now the new thought on it and it's what i would follow with my puppy is I would not do bite work per se, especially when it comes to defensive type or protective type things. I would do rag work with a puppy once the puppy teeth are in, but let the puppy be a puppy. Let the puppy gain confidence. Let the puppy be strong and independent and powerful so that when you bring this idea in, it will come from a place of confidence and power. Because when you're putting pressure on a little puppy, it's hard for the puppy to, to stand up to that. Think of a little boy. Think of taking a four-year-old kid and putting him in karate class. You've got to build this confidence. You've got to do all this stuff before you have the kid being aggressive or dominant. When a dog in the sports, IGP, for example, the dog is judged in the blind on dominating. And th this you can read. I'm, I'm, trust me, I am not an IGP expert, but I know a lot about the sport because I read a lot about it and I ask a lot of questions to really top people. The dog is judged in the blind on dominating the helper, right? That means the dog has to be dominant. It means an 80-pound dog has to be dominant over a 200-pound helper. So they need to be confident. Confidence is something that you build in a puppy before you put pressure on the puppy. And that's really, really important. So I would really rethink that. I think that's a really, really big piece to rethink. So guys... There's 319 people in the room. That's, I think, the most we've ever had. I want to thank you for following me, for being a friend to dogs, for advocating for good dog training, and for doing what's best for the human dog bond. That is my mission. That is a hill I wish to die on. That is a, something I wish to be etched in my gravestone, is that my life was about making the world a better place for dogs and the people who love them. Um, I, I, I care deeply for dogs. I care deeply for people who care about them. And um, I want to keep that fight going. So as I said, I'll be doing more and more to advocate for that, to help dog owners, as I've done all along, shelter dogs, rescue dogs, um, people training dogs. I want to support young dog trainers. I want to support dog trainers who are getting into the field, who are making that decision not to make a lot of money, 
but to make a lot of difference because that's what it's about. Be sure you subscribe to this channel. Be sure you hit the like button on the video. Thank you so much for your time. Your time is the greatest gift that you have and sharing it with me means the world to me. Thank you for that. Um, I will see you soon. Check out my site, robertcabral.com. Lots of great information there. A lot of great stuff here on Facebook and YouTube. And I hope to see you soon. God bless you all. And uh, I'll see you very soon. Take care.